You're listening to Inside the Village, where all news is local and no topic is off limits. So help me, Bob, it's bully in the alley. Hey, hey, bully in the alley. So help me, Bob, it's bully Welcome in the back for another edition of Inside the Village. It's February the 8th, 2024, with Michael Friscalanti, editor in chief here at Village Media, Derek Turner, our executive producer. I'm Scott Sexsmith. Uh, great to be back. Uh, you know, we, we we say this far too often. As of late, it is another uh, sad day uh, in the media industry. Yeah, we're just watching the headlines now. The, the latest news coming out about Bell and CTV. Um, you know, as, as working in the news business as journalists, uh, you hate to see this kind of news. It seems to be happening too often. Yeah, uh, and and just uh, you 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 mentioned it. Uh, it's coming in as we speak. Uh, Forty five of 103 reg- uh, regional radio stations. Uh, being sold. Uh, this will affect approximately uh, 4,800 uh, jobs. But it's not just a radio issue. Uh, on the TV side, it, it seems as though weekday noon newscasts at all CTV stations except Toronto uh, will be ending. Uh, the uh, network or the parent company BCE also scrapping at 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. newscasts on weekends at all CTV and CTV2 stations except Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. Uh, BC, Ontario, Quebec, and Atlantic Canada is affected. Uh, and and they, they wasted no time. They shut down the, uh, the new newscast today in places like Atlantic Canada, uh, where markets like Cape Breton uh, are dealing with uh, states of emergency because of record snowfall. Yeah, and what it means in a nutshell is just less quality local journalism in our country and in our province. Um, less stories you can depend on, less journalism you can depend on and rely on, especially in, in cases of emergency like that. You know, and, and this has been a, a trend we've seen for many years now, unfortunately. Um, you know, it just makes us feel that our mission here, Village, is that much more important, that we're trying to be in those communities, be in so many communities and tell the stories that matter most and keep people informed. Um, the industry has just changed phenomenally in the 25 years I've been in it. Yeah, and uh, that's a that's a good segue. Uh, first of all, you, you hate to see anybody uh, in this industry or any industry uh, lose their job, but certainly we've we've been hearing uh, far too often about uh, record cuts uh, in media uh, and in journalism, um, and and that kind of segues us to uh, you know we were proud to announce uh, the launch earlier this week uh, of FlamboroughToday.com. Yeah, we're very privileged to be part of a company that's doing this kind of stuff that we're actually launching. I mean, in the face of what happened with Metroland recently as well, closing down seventy one community newspapers in Ontario. Here we are announcing big news. We just purchased Oakville News, a, right. a, a news site uh, in Oakville, obviously, and we just launched FlamboroughToday.com, which is part of Hamilton. Um, it's our 23rd owned and operated site in the village chain. Uh, and it's the, the, the the response was just overwhelming. We've had a little uh, coffee party, buying the community coffee on the first morning. And so dozens of people came out just so happy that we're there. And the editor, Brenda Jeffries, is from that area. She's lived there you know, for years and years and covered the news there and just so many people stopping her in grocery stores and at the street just saying hey we're so excited that you're here and you just see it with the engagement with some great pieces of journalism in the first few days and uh, people are are reading it they love it and it's at those grassroots levels where those connections are made and perhaps that's the disconnect with these larger media conglomerates um you know that that haven't uh, embraced local the way that companies like uh, like ours has. Well, it's our thing, right? I mean, we believe in having our journalists who live and work in the community, so they care about that community. And, and it's different. And as somebody who's, you know, I did spend a lot of my career covering, uh, working for a national magazine, larger outlets. You didn't always have that sense that you were going to walk past the person you were writing about or the community was going to know that you, that you live there. And so you, there's a, they're expecting you to, 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 to have the highest integrity possible when you cover the news. And uh, now being here for a couple of years, you really see that. I mean, it's, it's just it's a bit of a different beast, but it's so critical because people can read the same headlines from around the world on all, so many different sources, yeah. but they're not going to be able to get their headlines from Flamborough except at Flamborough today. So that's, that's the great thing about it. All right, as we continue the uh, first word to Frisco, we will transition from Flamborough to Sault Ste. Marie and uh, a batch of uh, insolvent landlords uh, who are now seeking creditor protection. This is a prime example of the local journalism we do. There, This is a story that uh, James Hopkins at Sioux Today has been writing about for two years. Um, this is a, there's a company actually, a bunch of companies based in Burlington, which we also have a site in, uh, and they've been buying up um, properties, a lot of them unseen in Northern Ontario, hundreds of properties in Timmins, Sault Ste. Marie, Sudbury, and 
Uh, in some cases, they're they're the landlords and they're renting out these places. And in some cases, they're just totally speculating and the house is boarded up and they're just, you know, I guess the, the hope being that one day the prices will go up a little bit and they can flip these houses. Um, but you have to remember at the, during the pandemic when the housing market was so hot, if a family was trying to buy an affordable home, it was sold within hours to these kind of these kind of companies that were coming from southern Ontario. So now the the, the, the house has fallen down essentially. They've they filed for creditor protection, saying they have one hundred and forty four million dollars in debts wow. and about a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, and they're looking for creditor protection. And uh, they owe the city of Sault Ste. Marie, for example, six hundred and forty five thousand dollars, including six, more than six hundred grand in back taxes. But imagine you didn't pay your property taxes. What, what would happen? Well, right? I think we talked about yeah. that before. Right? So, yeah. it, so here we are. When that story broke, we are the paper of record that had all these backstories about these companies and the effects they were having on tenants here and the impact they were having on the housing market and the vacant houses that were boarded up all over town. Um, so, you know. Uh, it's a terrible story, but as an editor, I'm proud of the work we've done because we've been telling the community about this this story, and now we're in this chapter of it. All right, uh, and finally, uh, two words I never imagined I would say on this program, unforeseen circumcisions. <laughs> this was the laugh of the week, definitely. <laughs> and Timmins, uh, Timmins today had the story up where uh, a pizza hut, had, uh, I guess, had to close. And then they had the typo of the century. Instead of unforeseen, cir- we had to close for unforeseen circumstances. It was closed for unforeseen circumcisions. And uh, the team out there, Timmins, uh, had the picture posted. The story, of course, went viral. People were talking about it like crazy. And it it, uh, it kept our streak going of making the late night uh, U.S. Uh, it's been crazy. It's, yeah, I think it was Jimmy Fallon that made a good joke about it, right? Yep, Jimmy and, Fallon, like, yep. You think we've had, like, Jimmy Fallon joked about the Aurelia Christmas tree last year. Um, Derek was mentioned in this hour's 22 minutes was joking about the uh, Sioux guy who paddled Brent, the, Brent the, the giant and pumpkin, the yep. giant pumpkin, and then of course the right the most famous one, <laughs> Stephen Colbert and the the Thorold zucchini, the world's longest yeah, zucchini. Yeah, so we, you know we certainly aren't striving in this uh, in this <laughs> business to make sure that our stories make uh, the U.S. comedy shows, uh, but. Uh, Hey, it is what it is. Well, what's that saying? It doesn't matter what they say as long as they spell your name correctly. That's you know, right. Some things are unforeseen. <laughs> and and circumcisions apparently are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, okay, let's uh, transition to what's uh, on uh, tap for today. Uh, and it's certainly slightly more serious. Uh, David Orzetti, the uh, president of Sioux College, will be here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Immigration Minister uh, Mark Miller uh, announced that the feds were cutting the uh, number of uh, international student visas by a whopping 35%. That is going to have huge ramifications. We know that Mike Moffat uh, was on a couple of weeks ago, but uh, today we're going to hear uh, from the uh, institution side of things. Yeah, it's a really, it's a story that just keeps unfolding. And uh, universities and colleges are kind of, you know, the dust has settled and they're starting to see just what the ramifications this is going to have. So Mike was a great guest because he could kind of take us an overview of, of what, what had happened and how we got here. Um, David has been really speaking out about how this is going to impact uh, not just his college, but institutions around the province. And uh, he's here in our city, so we invited him to come by. I think it's going to be a good chat. Yeah, and he brings an interesting perspective, too, because he's a former uh, provincial cabinet minister. Yes, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. A former MPP under the Wynn government yeah. and a cabinet minister. So he's sat on the ball. He's been on the side of the table where he hears people saying, writing him the kind of letters that he's writing now right. to the government. So yeah, it'll be a really interesting chat. All right. David Orzetti, president of Sioux College, joins Frisco next when Inside the Village returns right after this. Reporters, editors, and journalists who go the extra mile to get the story and get it right. Go behind the scenes with those who cover the stories that matter most to you and your community. Look for it in the Village Features section of your favourite Village Media website across Ontario. All right, we're back on Inside the Village, joined again, as we mentioned, with with, uh, David Orzetti, uh, the president of Sioux College here in Sault Ste. Marie. Thanks so much for coming in, David. Yeah, good afternoon, Michael. It's uh, great to be here with you. Amazing. Uh, We're going to have a a, a detailed conversation, I think, but we're going to try to keep it uh, so that our audience can understand what's going on, because as you know better than anybody, this is an issue that people are talking about all over the country. Of course, the the idea that the the federal government has wanted to cap the number of international students coming to Canada, and it's caused all kinds of ripple effects to institutions around the country, yours included. But let's just start with kind of how we got here, David. Uh, You know, I've seen different numbers from different sources. I'm sure you have as well. But it's kind of clear that over the last decade or so, the number of international students in Canada really skyrocketed, for lack of a better word. Why did that happen? Why, Why was that necessary? So a couple of factors uh, that's been influencing that. And, um, 
you know, the d- local demographic uh, numbers, for example, in many communities uh, outside of the GTA, for example, uh, have faced challenges uh, with demographic and enrol- uh, demographic numbers related to enrollment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have to say, though, that some of the uh, certainly some of the uh, GTA schools have faced that as well, and they've they've mm-hmm. seen a transition too. Yeah. So, I, you know, it's something that's happening really uh, nationally. Um, and and uh, you know there is uh, an appetite for the federal government to increase uh, immigration, right? Mm-hmm. So the federal government policy was to increase immigration. Uh, colleges, universities are looking for other uh, ways to recruit students and other places to recruit students from. Mm-hmm. And so really we're in a global marketplace these days and colleges and universities have recruiters around the world uh, looking to bring students to their home campuses. Um, in many ways, it, it, you know, it's to substitute uh, declining uh, domestic enrollment mm-hmm. and our domestic enrollment challenges are, are not something that um, are not widely known. It's, it's been a reality that we've been faced with certainly for uh, more than a decade, right? Mm-hmm. We've probably seen about 100 students less per year domestically at the college uh, since, let's say, 2013. Mm-hmm. Now, for your viewers, the college overall enrollment hasn't changed in uh, in 10 years. So mm-hmm. roughly 24 or 2,500 students on the Sioux College campus That's today, yeah. the same number in 2013, the difference being that a thousand of those students are in our international. That's right. So every year, a little f- fewer domestic students, a few more international students. Kind of the way the trend has been. Right, and the international uh, student numbers at the college have been about the same for the last three years. So mm-hmm. we're at about a thousand students, and that's where we've been uh, holding the number. Uh, obviously, that number could be increased, but um, there are other factors to consider. Mm-hmm. Right, housing and supports. Uh, that the college can provide and uh, that the community can support and sustain. Mm -hmm. But certainly I think if you look around the community and many of the different businesses, um, our international students, you'll find uh, working in many places in the community, um, you know, they're bringing their financial resources to the community and and uh, helping to support the local economy. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the, The one of the things that a lot of people talk about when they hear about this issue is that oh. The, the reason there's there's been such an increase in international students is because the tuition is a lot higher that you can charge them. And it's it's a revenue stream for schools, right? How accurate is that? There is a difference, obviously, between what you can charge a domestic student and an international student. Sure. Uh, so at the college, we're roughly around $16,000 for an international student. A university would be about $31,000. Mm-hmm. So, you know, pretty much double mm-hmm. uh, in the sector. Uh, our tuition is fairly low for the college sector across Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe the eighth, we're eighth lowest. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's less than $3,000 for a student to attend college for a year um, mm-hmm. in a, in a no, you know, average program in the, at, at the college. Mm-hmm. Uh, the universities are more than double that, so they're receiving higher tuition, uh, double the international tuition fees and about $1,400 more in grant money from the province per student. So mm-hmm. colleges are not funded at the same level that um, universities are for mm-hmm. each domestic student. Mm-hmm. And when you look at some of the programs we have at the colleges, uh, um, programs like aviation and skilled trades, uh, very uh, costly programs to mm-hmm. run, a lot of equipment, health science programs mm-hmm. as well. It's, um, it's a significant challenge to try to... Um, uh, you know, generate the revenue that will help uh, enroll students and also be responsive to local employers. And that's mm-hmm. really the mandate of a community college. It's mm-hmm. to be responsive to local employers. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to get this out of the way too, because there's some yeah. people who kind of have this misunderstanding that these international students are getting spaces at your college at the expense of domestic students. But that's not what you've seen. You've seen the opposite. Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, you know, domestic students um, would not have programs to enroll in if it were not for international students in many cases. Because mm-hmm. if we have three or four or five domestic students that want to take a certain program, mm-hmm. we might not be able to offer that program because it's just far too costly mm-hmm. if we don't have international enrollment mm-hmm. at the college to help support that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're certainly not taking, uh, not taking spots from um, from domestic students in any way. I appreciate that. And you've mentioned the, the economic impacts of the community, which are important. In a place like Sault Ste. Marie, for example, these are not just students who are going to school. Like you said, they're working at the restaurants. They're, they're, I see Uber Eats. They're doing DoorDash. Well, can you speak to that, David? What are, what are the economic uh, ramifications, the, the impact that they have? So when students uh, come to Sault Ste. Marie or any community for that matter in Canada, they're 
permitted to work about 20 hours a week mm -hmm. in addition to their studies. Mm -hmm. That number has fluctuated. It's been as high as 30 mm -hmm. hours. There's mm -hmm. a suggestion, I believe, from uh, from some business associations that that be increased to 30 mm -hmm. and be maintained mm -hmm. at 30 uh, hours uh, per week. Uh, so, uh, you know, young people that are coming to Sault Ste. Marie, they are looking for jobs. They are looking for work. Uh, mm -hmm. We had yesterday a, uh, a career fair. We had over 100 local employers uh, connecting with our students uh, and employers looking for employees. Mm -hmm. Right? There, we, have, we have tremendous shortages in the economic, you know, in the economy. And um, if we don't have international students coming to get the training that they need, uh, many of them come with a prior education as well. So uh, this is not their first sort of entry into the uh, mm -hmm. post-secondary sector. Mm -hmm. um, we won't have people working in many areas of the economy that we that we expect. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you take, for example, um, uh, PSWs, uh, personal support workers, uh, right now uh, the the vacancy is nineteen thousand positions in Ontario. Mm -hmm. uh, if we do not graduate more PSWs, uh, we'll have we'll have more individuals, usually, uh, you know, our most vulnerable citizens in Ontario, our elderly uh, citizens, that will that will not get the service that they need. Mm -hmm. uh, so the international enrollment does a number of things, both for the economy, uh, for the community, for the college, um, and and it really are uh, important mm -hmm. uh, to to Canada's fabric. I you know the the sort of knee jerk reaction is what I'm you know referring to it as by the federal government that it made this decision with really no consultation with anyone in the sector. There there was no consultation with the colleges or universities. This decision just was made, mm -hmm. and it, and I think it was made because of how it has intersected with the housing pressures. Mm -hmm. um, we've had, I think, a federal government that has been, um, you know, ha has not effectively rolled out uh, a housing strategy and has been caught, uh, you know, with a, an immigration policy that has been uh, seeing, you know, many newcomers come to Canada without the housing supports. Mm -hmm. And so I think in some ways, you know, students are being scapegoated in this. There's mm -hmm. There are many categories of, of immigration, there's a refugee category. There are there are other categories of immigrants that come to Canada. It's mm -hmm. not only uh, students. They're mm -hmm. coming with financial resources. Uh, they're coming to work, um, and they're coming to help support the economy. Mm -hmm. So uh, the federal government made this decision. We're going to have to live by it. Uh, they've reduced the number of study permits by about 35 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, Ontario had was was a bit ahead in terms of the numbers that th that were issued in Ontario. So we're mm -hmm. probably going to see closer to a 50% reduction uh, mm -hmm. in Ontario. And that, and the other aspect of the decision the federal government made was they removed the eligibility uh, for students graduating from uh, a private, a public private partner college mm -hmm. uh, from issuing those postgraduate work permits. Mm -hmm. And that's a real problem for us because um, 15 colleges in Ontario out of the 24 have uh, public-private partner mm -hmm. campuses, mm -hmm. and that campus uh, in Toronto that uh, that we interact with with Trios. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, there are two sites with a combined total of about twenty-eight hundred uh, students. There's two sites. Right? We have two sites: one, one in, in Toronto Southwest and one in Brampton. One in Brampton. Okay. And uh, with about twenty-eight hundred students, so a little bit more than the the number uh, on our own. So about home 25, campus. 2,600 here in the Sioux. 24 to 24. 25. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. another 2,800 Eight. at the two campuses there. Right. Okay. Let's, let's talk about that. Cause that's an important part. Right? Absolutely. So this, this private public partnership with you have, and that you said, as you mentioned, a lot of other colleges have, tell me about that. How does that work? And what, what what's the benefit of that for you? So, you know, uh, more than a decade ago, uh, colleges began and universities began partnering with private uh, sector institutions, private career colleges mm -hmm. and other private entities to deliver um, programs. Mm -hmm. And this was really a sustainability issue. As our domestic enrollment declined, uh, rather than have layoffs in our community, job losses, and a lack of trained individuals to support our business community, um, colleges in the north and in other areas outside of the GTA decided that they would open or work with a private partner 
to create a campus, uh, and that campus would have, say, Sioux College students on it. Those Sioux College students would take the same programs that were offered by the home campus. The curriculum would be identical. Mm -hmm. Um, The credential that the student would receive would be a Sioux College credential. Our quality assurance department would oversee the uh, quality of the education. The instructors would be uh, qualified in the same way. Mm -hmm. So in all ways, shapes, and forms, these individuals and students graduating in our partner campuses are an extension of of Sioux College. And we did that um, for sustainability reasons. So about a decade ago, six colleges entered into these partnerships. Mm -hmm. And then the provincial government that I was a part of decided that they would put uh, a moratorium on this so that no additional colleges could uh, create a partnership. Mm -hmm. Sioux College at the time didn't have a partnership. We were not one of the early Mm -hmm. adopters. Um, And you know, really the issue um, began to uh, evolve as a result, as they say, of necessity and and colleges not being able to be sustainable with declining domestic enrollment, with uh, less than ideal government grant funding. Uh, and then in 2018, when the Ford government uh, came into power, they lifted the moratorium mm-hmm. and nine additional colleges joined and formed Mm -hmm. private-public partnerships. Mm -hmm. So there are 15 of 24 colleges that rely on these. Mm -hmm. But the federal government in sort of one fell swoop here has really just undone all of that Mm -hmm. and said, sorry, uh, you're not going to, we're not going to allow students graduating from these Mm -hmm. highly regulated environments Mm -hmm. having the same credential to receive a postgraduate work permit. So before we get to that, so the, 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 the main thinking was we can't recruit enough students to our home campus in, say, Northern Ontario but we can recruit them to a campus in Toronto and Brampton. That's part of the thinking. Absolutely. Okay. You're, you're correct. And, and you know, uh, and I and I said this at the time, people that know that I work, you know, that I, people that I worked with and colleagues that I worked with, they know that um, there were a number of voices around the table uh, advocating for, you know, uh, policies that would see um, more effective student settlement in communities across Ontario and not, um, you know, having all of the students land in the, you know, in the GTA. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the absence of policy that helped to encourage students to, or incentivize students to study in another community outside of, outside of Toronto, um, you know, colleges began opening these campuses and partner with, with partners in the GTA to, to uh, mm-hmm. to pay the bills, to keep the lights on, and to uh, you know all of the money, for example, that we receive from our private partner comes back to Sault Ste. Marie, mm-hmm. and it's reinvested here. That's money that supports our local economy. So they essentially pay you a licensing fee, basically. So so when the student pays the tuition mm-hmm. to the to the to us, so mm-hmm. the student is registered at Sioux College. Mm-hmm. Um, there is there's a formula, and there's a range. Uh, colleges mm-hmm. are receiving anywhere from eighteen to twenty five percent, let's say, mm-hmm. of the uh, of the revenue, depending on their particular mm-hmm. uh, arrangement mm-hmm. that is that is returning to the yeah. home campus. Yeah. And in our case, that's forty million dollars. So. Yeah. It's of a hundred twenty million dollar a year budget is that of correct? our of our yeah. hundred twenty million dollars. So budget. these twenty gross revenue. These twenty eight hundred students generate that for you, right? As that, part that, of our that, partner, yeah. As part of your partner, okay. Yeah. And and that money is I just can't imagine you operating the same way. Whether that's if you took a third of our budget out, that would right. be, be major consequences right. to that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So and just so I'm clear, um, all um, your institution at Sioux College can give a, a work permit to a graduate after, and under the old rules. Trials could do it as well. If they were a student at trials, they could also get a postgraduate. So the federal permit. government actually issues the work permit, yes, but sorry, but, yes, it, yes. but it's no, it's yeah, you're right. my my explanation here. I, yeah. it's it's uh, a bit of a nuance. But when the student completes their program and, and they're successful, they make the application. They're on a study. They're on a study permit. They make the application, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. they're eligible because they're that's an area where there's eligibility. Mm-hmm. So on a on a traditional public college campus, they meet the eligibility. Mm-hmm. On a public private campus, they have met the eligibility. So the student would say, well, I can study in Sault Ste. Marie or I can study in Brampton or I can study in Toronto Southwest, receive a Sioux College credential. And at any of those campuses, once I successfully complete my program, uh, I'm eligible to receive a postgraduate work permit. Mm-hmm. And they would apply to the federal government for that. Mm-hmm. The federal government has now said, if a student attends a private partner campus, 
that student, even if they successfully complete the program, mm -hmm. is no longer eligible to receive the permit. That's right. If I'm one of those students, I'm probably going to think twice, say, well, I'm not going to go to that school then, right? Absolutely. Which is, which is exactly the, the concern, right? Absolutely. Uh, so were you completely caught off guard by this announcement from the like, No, they didn't call you at all and say, hey, David, <laughs> what do you think? I, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, am, I am shocked by the way this was done. Um, I received an email through our national association on um, a Saturday afternoon, mm -hmm. several weeks ago. Uh, Sunday, uh, we began calls um, discussing, meetings Meetings were set up to have, to have follow up mm -hmm. on Sunday and spent most of the day on Sunday uh, on Teams calls and in meetings trying to determine, you know, what, because we were hearing and, you know, we were getting information um, pieces and parts of it mm -hmm. and weren't sure whether or not we had the full picture of what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, uh, we thought there was a potential announcement maybe coming that week um, or even or even later. But mm -hmm. uh, Monday morning at 8.30, uh, Minister Miller, I believe, was in Montreal with the federal mm -hmm. cabinet retreat, mm -hmm. uh, just announced these changes. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know that... Um, I don't know that all the MPPs, or sorry, MPs, all the federal MPs, even knew that was getting rolled out. Mm -hmm. um, so, it uh, really speaks to, you know, this kind of decision making in a vacuum, mm -hmm. um, you know, without any consultation and without any discussion. I, you know, I believed at first that this was an unintended consequence that that you would say, okay, uh, you want the numbers down. I understand that. You're, everyone's going to take uh, a reduction. Uh, but in terms of what Ontario will be eligible for in terms of the number of study permits, that would be left to the Provincial Ministry of Colleges and Universities mm -hmm. to determine what is referred to as a designated learning institution. Mm -hmm. So a DLI status. If they have the DLI status, they're eligible for study mm -hmm. permits uh, and work permits and so on. I assume that it was an unintended consequence that that the federal government, uh, you know, yeah. would allow jurisdictionally the province to say, "Look, we should have the authority to decide who we believe is a reputable institution in our province delivering quality mm -hmm. education, and then we'll allocate those study permits." Uh, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. They um, they took a very clear shot at any public. Uh, institution that had a private partner that they were working with to deliver those programs. Which is, like you said, the majority of colleges in Ontario. Well, yeah, there's uh, absolutely, there's uh, about 61,000 or mm -hmm. so students mm -hmm. that are in these partnerships. And so you've heard the term bad actor thrown yeah, around. Was, and there was, was my next question. Okay. <laughs> go, well, you know what? I'll let you ask it then. I'm sorry. Well, no, you no. Go ahead, go ahead. It's, it's go great ahead. because the, the two main messages I heard from Mar uh, Minister Miller was, Housing, 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 and bad actors. Those are the, so right. there have been lots of reports, and and these are concerning reports about you know students in some in Brampton, for example, you know twelve of them in a basement apartment, you know trying to trying to live that way, and and then the concern in that community that that's happening. So that's one concern that he mentioned, and the other one, of course, the bad actors. They, they, this is an attempt to crack down on those you know shady private colleges, for example, who are, are taking advantages of students and and some of the international recruiters who may be doing shady things as well. Let's stick with the bad actors first. What do you think of that? And and because there they are, there are bad actors. I'm sure you've seen them. And you've heard. You know who they are. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. There are. Mm -hmm. And 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 again. And Miller, Minister Miller, you know, acknowledged this at his press conference. Is you know, this is a fairly blunt instrument that we're using, mm -hmm. right? What, he was not being very strategic or very surgical about mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. which. You know, we're saying I think I think you missed the mark on that. So again, you can bring the numbers down, but the question is, how do you how do you get rid of the bad actors in the sector? Mm -hmm. So we in the sector know who the bad actors are, mm -hmm. and um, there are uh, ministry binding policy directives that you're uh, required to follow. Um, for example, all of the recruiting uh, needs to be done by a public uh, college mm -hmm. uh, or university mm -hmm. you cannot have your private partner doing that recruiting mm -hmm. because there's there there are ethical issues around that in terms of what students are being told what they're yeah. being promised mm -hmm. all of these things they need the proper training mm -hmm. um, but I think you know minister Miller missed the mark in saying that you know uh, all private you know the implication was that all private colleges uh, were bad and uh, all public entities, and public institutions are good. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now 
that there are bad actors in both spaces. There are bad, uh, you know, actors in the private space that have not behaved well, um, and that's a ministry compliance issue. So the ministry needs to get out there and mm-hmm. and and do their work around the compliance. There's over 600. My understanding is 600 private career colleges in Ontario, but um, 30 of the 600 have. Uh, you know, like ninety percent of the students mm-hmm. or more, mm-hmm. right? So, so you have a few larger, much larger players. Our partner, Trias College, has been around for over thirty years. Mm-hmm. They have a domestic market. They have many campuses. Mm-hmm. Um, they offer the students the same wraparound services we have. They offer them housing supports, mental health and counseling, mm-hmm. academic uh, supports, tutoring supports. Um, preferred rates for fitness facilities, uh, legal services. We are I mean, offering a complete package. We've also grown very modestly. We've been at this for four to five years now, and we're at 2,800 students. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you take a school like Conestoga College, right, that has grown um, to over, I, I'm hearing numbers as high as 37,000, I'd say 32,000 easy, but in the last year, mm-hmm. 20,000 plus students. Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you take 20,000 students mm-hmm. into your community and have housing for them and services and mm-hmm. everything that they need without creating chaos? You mm-hmm. can take a look at any sort of online you know, discussion sites where in that community, uh, people are really, mm-hmm. really upset. Mm-hmm. And so, so Minister Miller's not wrong in the bad actor uh, on the bad actor you know issue, and it's happening. But the but the way to get at that is to be a little bit more thoughtful and maybe have some consultation about it. Maybe have some dialogue mm-hmm. and and discuss what kinds of parameters we can put in place to deal with that. Mm-hmm. And you know that goes that holds true for the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, right? Provincially, mm-hmm. there are things that can be done, right? Mm-hmm. We saw the. You know, CBC reports a number of years ago with the ratio formula that the province had, and you know, individuals exceeding the ratio, uh, mm-hmm. we needed we needed compliance, and mm-hmm. you know, we didn't have compliance, and so now you have, you know, bad actors uh, in the public sector and the private sector, mm-hmm. and um, everyone getting uh, everyone getting hit and hurt by this. Um, unfortunately, has and, a college like Conestoga made things worse for you? Have they given the whole? In, uh, college system a bad name well the way they behave you know i think i think uh you know look i i need to be a bit uh, i need to be careful with this obviously because we're all in the public space here but uh, all of my colleagues know uh you know this is a matter of public record all of my colleagues know who has been causing problems in the uh, in the sector uh you know and to hear comments from conestoga you know like the problem has been in the private sector is really kind of laughable mm-hmm. um, because it's it's just been it's been it's been really uh, irresponsible mm-hmm. and you know I certainly I you know caught the attention of uh, Minister Miller and the federal government and, and and frankly Ontarians and Canadians that are getting frustrated by you know increasing costs for housing increasing costs for rent mm-hmm. and again though that comes back to some extent to the federal government who you know had had launched an immigration policy uh, you know, without a corresponding a housing strategy to help support the immigration that we were going to have, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the quickest thing to do is to try to, uh, you know, look at a way to reduce the number of uh, people coming into uh, coming into Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're we're going to try to weather this, but uh, it's going to be very very difficult given the given the financial circumstances and the and the long-term effects. Because for the, the reality for you is that you may have nobody sign up next year in trials if those students who know that I, well, I can't get a, a work permit after. Right. Is that the right. reality? So 91% of the students, to your point, your, your 91% of the students that attend our partner campus apply for a postgraduate work permit, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So uh, it's, it's a challenge. Um, you know, federal government said they were issuing all kinds of student visas and uh, 20 to 25% of students weren't showing up on the institution site. Mm-hmm. We checked that. We had one student mm-hmm. of all international students not sh- show up on Sioux College campus. Mm-hmm. And at Trias, we had two. At two. Right? So you're so, tracking that stuff. So we're tracking it. Yeah. We're reporting mm-hmm. it to IRCC, the federal ministry. Mm-hmm. We're, you know, we're all over it. And we're trying to make sure, and we are complying in every way with the provincial rules and mm-hmm. the federal rules. Mm-hmm. But we got caught in, mm-hmm. you know, um, 
the the sort of lumped in the ba- you know the bad mm-hmm. actor category mm-hmm. where I think there was a lot of frustration at the federal level. You know, ca- Canadians. Uh, y- you look at the polling numbers. Canadians are saying that they are less supportive of the federal direction on their immigration policy today than they were you know, a year ago. Mm-hmm. And so they're seeing the same numbers we're seeing and mm-hmm. they're feeling like there's pressure to react here. Mm-hmm. The one thing you would know better than most people because you're a former Ontario cabinet minister is you've been on the other side as well, right? Where you've been uh, the one getting the letter sent to and being questioned on a decision that the cabinet makes, right? Um, is there anything, I don't want to say, do you sympathize with what they're doing, but do you understand what it's like sometimes to make these difficult decisions that don't make everybody happy? Well, I, I certainly do, and I and I get that perspective. I I just you know in terms of in terms of not talking to the sector and not having a bit more of a thoughtful plan mm-hmm. and the place to get to uh, to do this in a more responsible way. I don't you know I don't I don't buy that there wasn't time to do that. I mean this has been a runaway train for quite some time, and mm-hmm. we can't have you know policies being rolled out without without some awareness, without some discussion what's the harm in trying to get the policy, uh, you know, uh, right by having some conversations mm-hmm. with the sector about what the rules need to be for some of these organizations and uh, conversations around compliance with the provincial ministries in the respective provinces. Mm-hmm. You know, the other the other thing about this decision is it really smacks of a bit of elitism. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really a pro-university decision the federal government has made. They've allowed a number of private universities operating in Canada and Ontario, Northeastern University, Niagara University, they are not regulated in any way by a public entity. They're not connected to a public entity or the public sector in any way to continue to be eligible for postgraduate work permits, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm not sure why, but a private college that's a partner with a public college offering their credentials, their oversight, isn't eligible. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so that, and then exempting all masters and PhD programs, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know, generic masters of arts programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you look at the numbers, and you look at the numbers in the construction sector, in the skilled trades, mm-hmm. in the healthcare fields, the colleges are helping to drive those graduates, and those are the graduates that I believe Canadians feel are are, are a priority, mm-hmm. right? If you want to actually correct the housing challenge or get more houses built in this country then why not offer longer postgraduate work permits for anyone coming to Canada signing up to take electrical, plumbing, carpentry, HVAC, civil engineering, all of these areas, any any healthcare field, right? We need healthcare workers. I mean, look what's happening in our own community, Mm -hmm. right? But the federal government has made a decision to penalize colleges and to exempt masters and PhD programs, Mm -hmm. right? So I I don't, you know, some of these programs are not really, um, you know, as I, I would say, a priority, and mm-hmm. nor do most Canadians believe they're a priority. Mm-hmm. So, the, you know, it seemed like a bit of a bit of an elitist decision, if you will, looking at the looking at the sectors and and giving universities uh, many of these exemptions and allowing private universities to operate mm-hmm. uh, and issue postgraduate work permits with with no connection to a public entity or a public oversight. It's an interesting point. Um, since this announcement was made, have you been able to speak to the Prime Minister on the phone? Did you have any time with him to explain your concerns? I wish I had, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I haven't. And um, I have reached out to many folks at the federal level, um, many uh, individuals that uh, you know come from circles in Queen's Park and had prior experience provincially mm-hmm. have found their way to Ottawa. Um, you, you know, I, again, I think they've, I think they've really missed the mark on this. I, I think, you know, if it was a, a 416 challenge, um, then, you know, we need policies that are, that are not a one size fits all policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have tried to, uh, you know, make these concerns known and I know other colleagues in the, in the public college sector, my colleagues, uh, mm-hmm. have tried to raise awareness through their municipal governments through their chambers of commerce um, mm-hmm. because they're being uh, impacted as well and they have private partners uh, with their public college that that is in effect being shut down. Mm. Can we talk housing just for a minute because I, I think that's a critical point because yep. you're immersed in this and you know this so well. The average person who's seeing this story unfold, what concerns them is when they see, I think it was in Timmins for example, where there's international students showing up and saying, I have nowhere to live, or I was accepted to this college and now they're saying I'm not and I'm, I'm, I don't have the spaces. 
I assume these are some of the bad actors that we're talking about, but how do you guarantee, I think the province is saying this to you guys too, you have to guarantee you have a space for these people to right. live. Is that part of, is that you, have you been able to do that at Sioux College? So is that realistic? So first of all, I don't believe it's realistic. Mm -hmm. um, it would be extremely difficult to do. We've asked the ministry to explain how they would like this done. They don't seem to have an answer, although mm -hmm. they've said it. You're, you're quite right. Mm -hmm. They've made the comment, uh, but they made the comment, I, I don't think without any, you know, real sort of uh, process in place to be able to achieve this. Mm -hmm. You know, the situation in Timmins, um, obviously unfortunate, and that was an example, I believe, that the private uh, career college was doing the recruiting, which was today, uh, or will be outside the binding policy around the public entity uh, doing the recruiting. And so Northern College, doing their best to manage the situation, uh, didn't want to see uh, students come, too many students come to their community and not have housing, right? Mm -hmm. But the private career college in that particular situation, looking to make additional revenue, uh, signing additional students up and making commitments that they couldn't uh, make good on mm -hmm. or were not aligned. I and mean, there seemed to be in the media some discrepancy over you know, um, the position on that issue between Northern and uh, mm -hmm. I believe it was Purist that was the, was the private partner. But mm -hmm. Northern, I believe, you know, removed uh, uh, offers, uh, revoked offers for students uh, because of that very fact, because mm -hmm. they did not want to be in a situation where they created a crisis in their community, mm -hmm. right? We, we do not want to be in a situation, and we know that there have been, you know, uh, uh, a few incidents where we've been challenged to find housing or other supports with students. But by and large, uh, you know, since uh, we've embarked on this uh, venture with international uh, students coming to our community, they, they have been an ben overall benefit to the community in terms of the economy, in terms of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, workers uh, uh, mm -hmm. working at uh, various businesses, uh, the, the investment that they bring to the community and so on. But we need to be very mindful about that. The other aspect, as, I, as I've touched on, is it would be important for the federal government to um, steer, if you will, some of the immigration. And I think potentially the province having those discussions could help that. I think Canadians, uh, you know, we're, we're a country built on immigration. Uh, but let's be thoughtful about this. Let's not just simply, uh, you know, have the doors wide open and not really care who is coming into the country to fill what particular jobs? Where are these individuals going to work? Why would you not incentivize uh, individuals to take up areas, for example, as I've said, in the housing construction industry or skilled trades mm -hmm. or healthcare fields, areas where Canadians, uh, Canada needs workers and needs these supports, right? So that really hasn't been on the mind of the federal government at all. Mm -hmm. uh, they've never thought about that. They, they don't have a process to do that. It certainly doesn't seem. They have a you know, immigration point system, but it doesn't seem to translate when it comes to the, uh, the international uh, student process. And we are uh, more than happy to op offer, and we do, labor market driven programs. In other words, there are spaces in our skilled trades programs. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to our recruiters and our department in that area, uh, looking for students that will come in to those areas that are in high demand. We want to see students uh, be gainfully employed mm -hmm. once they complete their program of study. So mm -hmm. if their program of study is not aligned with a job in the community, in the labor market, then we'll have students with credentials they can't do what we need done in this province mm -hmm. or in this country. Mm -hmm. So I think, David, one of the last things we'll talk about then is the reality, like you talked at the beginning of our discussion, this cap is coming. We know the government's going to lower the number of permits. Um, the much bigger question for you and for a lot of colleges is how is this going to impact the, your partnerships with these private institutions and the post-grad uh, work permits? Do you have any confidence at all that this can be worked out? Or are, you, are, you, are we going to go into next the fall semester with this in place? So as far as the relationships with the public colleges and their private partners, right now, as it stands, if nothing changes, these partner colleges will not be uh, enrolling anywhere near the number of students that they've been enrolling because, as you've indicated, students will not be able to be eligible for a postgraduate work permit. Mm -hmm. That will, in effect, cause a wind down between the public and the private partners. Mm -hmm. They will go back to the environment and the space they operated in previously. Some of them will disappear from the landscape because they were only created for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Ours, we, I believe, is, you know, they've been a really a gold standard partner. 
They've been around a long time, uh, mm-hmm. certainly well before this f- international phenomenon uh, with the with the student, you know, r- really when the re- numbers have been ramping up. And so I think they'll be in the in the in the province for the long term. Mm-hmm. Many others I think will see disappear. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the revenue disappearing to the private or to the public colleges is a uh, is a is a real problem. Um, you know, now what will happen is there will be a conversation around the allocation of the eligible study permits. So Ontario will see perhaps around 140,000 study permits to be divided among, uh, mm-hmm. you know, 40 plus institutions or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that will be a conversation that we'll all be having with the ministry and the ministry will have to decide how these permit. There, there won't be uh, you know, as many permits, uh, study permits for the schools as there has been uh, previously. And, and we're so talking th- even just the campus here, you're going to have probably the lowest amount you've had. In right. So time. we, so we have roughly, uh, you know, 500 study permits, for example, if you have a, about a thousand students on campus, you have about 500 study permits because they roll over and they get extended. So it's really based on your, your first year intake, mm-hmm. um, because they're multi-year, mm-hmm. um, but uh, you know we'll be um, we'll, we're having those conversations. That's a live discussion right now in terms of in terms of how the allocation occurs. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to have to we'll be working with the Ministry of Colleges and Universities to determine yeah a lot uh, of unanswered our, our, our allocation. Mm-hmm. You know as well uh, as well Algoma, I would mm-hmm. you know believe and and any other mm-hmm. public institution. But um, you know it again it. It really begs the question about sustainability in the sector, right? So, mm-hmm. so if we're going to have a sustainable post-secondary education sector in Ontario, then all schools need to be able to balance their budgets and be responsive to their community. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be in a situation where I have local employers saying to me, David, you know, we need to run this program because we need these workers. And I'm saying, well, we can't afford to run it because we only have four students signed up. We don't have the international students now to help support that program. Uh, we're going to, you know, choices for local kids Mm -hmm. will be narrowed Mm -hmm. uh, just because of the fact that you know uh, the squeeze has been put on Mm -hmm. us by by the federal government uh, in this regard so we're uh, we're a little ways away from September and we're going to do all we can to try to ensure that we maximize the number of study permits that are uh, available to us here in the community so that we can try and uh, you know balance our budget and protect all of the jobs that we have in our organization you know, I can't say enough about the people at the college that have worked so hard um, to try to advance our organization. You know, inc- incidentally, the $40 million that, that has been coming, you know, in our last budget that came to the college from our partner, that money's all earmarked for a new residence building, for mm-hmm. more housing in our community. Mm-hmm. It's being used for the things that the federal government is criticizing isn't happening, yes. but wasn't paying attention to this to see mm-hmm. that in, in some instances, that's exactly what was happening. And many of my colleagues were doing the exact same thing. Without their partner, they don't have the revenue because of the low tuition. The province froze the tuition five years ago. And when they froze it five years ago, they cut it by 10% first yes. and then froze it. We're at about 2015 tuition levels, right? That's Who right. is paying 2015 <laughs> costs for anything? No one's paying that Nobody. for gas, groceries, no. insurance, utilities. No one's paying 2015 prices, mm-hmm. but we're trying to run the college on 2015 yeah. revenue and then try to make these investments. So the investments related to uh, you know, a sports field and a track that we're trying to increase the amenities to try to grow the institution and provide more services for our local community, that's all taken a big hit because of yeah. the federal government's, um, you know, uh, I think it was, you know, reckless decision around how this was done. I get, I get the, I get the housing challenge, and again, I think they brought that on themselves to a large extent. Um, but it, it was not, it was not a very thoughtful way to go about rolling this out. Do you think you'll ever have a FaceTime with Mark Miller? I'd love to have some FaceTime with Mark yeah. Miller. You've asked for it, I assume. We've we've <laughs> asked we've asked everyone who will listen. We've written uh, we've written to the minister, to the prime minister, to mm-hmm. uh, their chiefs of staff. Uh, to I've talked to other federal MPs. Um, you know, it just um, it doesn't seem like there's an appetite. It seems, as I say, that there's a bit of bias in their thinking that mm-hmm. uh, all public institutions are good, all private institutions are bad. They're the bad actors. Let's just go with this, mm-hmm. and uh, you know we're on to the next thing now. We're not we're not going to go back and look at look at the damage that's been caused in the sector. Mm-hmm. Um, so, 
Well, I appreciate this chat because I think yeah. it helps a lot of people who don't um, understand the issue as well as you do to understand it. Is there anything I didn't ask you, David, that you wanted to get across today? I think I we think, covered a I lot of things. You, I think you've been uh, very thorough, Michael. You, uh, we try. You, you understand the issues very well. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the time uh, uh, to be able to, to come on your program and talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we're facing and help to, you know, uh, help the viewers understand uh, you know, the landscape in this sector mm-hmm. a bit better in terms of, you know, decisions that are being made by the federal government and provincial government in relation to what we do at the college. Mm-hmm. So, you know, regardless of the decisions that get made, this one and for future one, uh, you know, decisions that may impact us, we're just going to continue to, uh, you know, keep working as hard as we can to try to uh, mm-hmm. build, build the, continue to build a great organization and uh, be as responsive as we can to our local community. Right. And I, again, I, you know, I want to thank all the local employers that, that came out yesterday for uh, what was, uh, I think, our 25th annual job fair, career mm-hmm. fair at the, at the college. And um, they, they, uh, they were very welcome all the time, obviously, on our campus. But, um, you know, a great way to connect uh, our young graduates uh, to local jobs. Well, so. keep us in the loop, so maybe okay. you'll come back in a few months if you have some other news for us All right. this year. Okay? Happy to. Thanks, Thank Steve. you very much. Much, much appreciated. Thank you, Thank much, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. For the latest in in-depth features and enterprise journalism from your local writers at Village Media, be sure to check out The Big Read. The Big Read. It's the full story behind the headlines. Look for The Big Read on your favourite Village Media website across Ontario. All right, back to wrap on another episode of Inside the Village. Great conversation with David. Interesting to hear the perspective uh, from the educational institution side of yeah, things. I also love the aspect that David Orzetti, of course, was a cabinet minister in the Wynn government. Of course. Right? And he's been on the other side, been in government, and has probably had lots of examples of ang- people angry at him about a decision that the government made. Yep. There are probably times in, here in the Sioux, he probably wanted to go to Canadian Tire on a Sunday and just cover his <laughs> head, right? Because nobody, he doesn't want to hear from people. But the, yeah, the, so, so now he's on the other side and, and fighting what he considers to be a, a terrible decision. But again, I, I say it every week. These are the kind of conversations we like to have on the podcast because it's, it's deep, it's in-depth. People will, I learned something, so our listeners will learn something. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of perspectives on this issue. I think we could do a podcast every week on this one. Yep, certainly could. All right. Uh, That's it for this week. If you'd like to reach out, uh, we encourage you to do so. ITV at villagemedia.ca. You can, uh, of course, catch all of our episodes across the Village Media Network uh, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. For Derek Turner, executive producer of the show, Michael Friscalanti, editor in chief, I'm Scott Sexsmith. We'll talk to you next week. You've been listening to Inside the Village. Fresco and Scott's wardrobe provided in part by Moore's Sault Ste. Marie.